say to those that are visiting this morning, we're very glad that you're here. We hope that you'll come back again every time that you can. If you live in this area, we hope you'll come back on a regular basis as the congregation meets here to study God's Word and to worship God in harmony with what we find revealed in the New Testament Scriptures. It is our purpose that we might be of encouragement and help to each other as we seek to serve the Lord and enjoy the blessings and benefits that Christianity provides both now and forever. As a beginning point for our lesson, Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, Jesus said the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. This morning I want us to think for a few minutes about a question and seek to find uh, whatever the Bible might say that would help us in uh, knowing the answer to that question. The question is, will there be varying rewards in heaven? Now, you may not have heard a sermon preached on that subject before, and I might ought to go ahead and let the cat out of the bag just a little bit. You may not know the answer when I finish. But we are going to study some things that are involved in that question. This is really an old question, but it's a question that maybe many of us may not have given much thought to. I had a discussion with an older gospel preacher, in fact, a man who'd been preaching the gospel probably more years than I've been living upon this earth. Uh, and he had just recently uh, got into a situation where he uh, heard some, uh, some powerful arguments, uh, at least uh, a lot of force behind those, though the arguments themselves may not have been all that powerful, uh, with regard to this subject, and it was a new subject to him, something he hadn't really given much thought to. You see, many of our religious friends insist that there are varying degrees of reward or varying rewards in heaven. Uh, on the basis, many people who insist on that do so on the basis of two wrong ideas or two false opinions uh, because of their concept that salvation is by faith only and because of uh, the human concept that once an individual becomes saved, he can't be lost. Now those are two of the reasons, and we'll explain how that ties in a little bit later, uh, why some insist that there must invariably be various rewards for the saved in heaven. Even though we can take the word of God and show that those two doctrines are not scriptural, that doesn't mean we ought to automatically dismiss the subject of, of varying rewards. Uh, a few years ago, I wasn't really very open to the idea that there might be different degrees of punishment in hell. Uh, I still don't know because I haven't been there. And, and uh, I know one thing about it. If there are, I don't want the best they've got. I don't want to go to hell. And even if there are different degrees of punishment, I don't want the best of them. There are some passages that seem to me to be very difficult to explain unless some will be punished more severely than others. But I'm not going to say they're impossible to explain. I, I, I may not know all there is to know about that, but I do know this. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go to hell. Now, there are some who insist there are varying rewards in heaven. I don't know about that for sure either. Uh, but I'm willing to take anything heaven has to offer. I want to go to heaven. And I want to avoid hell. And if there are different rewards, that'll, that, that'll, that'll suit me all right. I won't mind that. If there are different degrees of punishment in hell, that's fine as long as I can avoid all of them. But now let's look at the subject a little more closely. We want to show how and why the doctrines that I mentioned have led some to conclude there just must invariably be different rewards. And then having dismissed the two false doctrines, let's go on and study the subject. The first point that I want to make is that salvation is not by faith only. The reason the people who believe in salvation by faith only latch on to a concept of different rewards in heaven is because it allows them to answer what otherwise is a, is a difficult or impossible question. If indeed salvation is by faith only, then how are you going to explain passages like Matthew 16, 27, which says he'll reward people according to their works? 
how can salvation be by faith only and people be rewarded according to works? Well, the fellow who believes in salvation by faith only says, well, that's simple. Uh, salvation is by faith only, but there will be varying rewards according to how much a fellow worked. Well, I'll have to admit that would be reasonable. And the only thing I know for sure that's wrong with it is that salvation is not by faith only. That's wrong with it. So the whole concept upon which that argument is based is a false concept. The Bible does not teach salvation by faith only. In fact, in James chapter 2, and we're just going to look at two verses in James chapter 2 and just mention them very briefly. Uh, but James chapter 2 verse 19 says, You believe there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe that, and they tremble. So they do more than just believe it. They do a little bit about it, don't they? But they don't obey the Lord. Now, if salvation were by faith only, the devil would be saved. And I, as far as I know, haven't run across anybody who was willing to accept that concept. Salvation isn't by faith only. In fact, the only time in all the scripture that the term faith only is found, it's found later in James chapter 2, verse 24. And the, the passage plainly says, uh, based on the arguments made in that context, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now, that doesn't prove there won't be varying rewards in heaven. But if there are, it won't be because salvation is by faith only. Salvation is not by faith only. Justification is not by faith only. James chapter 2 shows that a faith has to get to work to be a living faith. And certainly we aren't going to be saved from dead works by a dead faith. Paul talks in the Galatian letter uh, about how faith which works through love is the kind of faith and the sort of thing that avails. Uh, and so uh, the Bible throughout teaches the importance of faith getting to work in action, uh, and we are not saved by faith only. So if a fellow says, well now, since we're saved by faith only uh, and rewarded according to our works, there just have to be varying degrees of reward. No, no because the major premise is wrong. We're not saved by faith only. There are a lot of verses talk about justification by faith, but there's only one passage that mentions justification by faith only and says we don't have it. We do not have salvation or justification by faith only. James chapter 2, verse 24. Well, let's look at the other. The other false concept that leads many to accept an idea that there are varying rewards in heaven is the concept of once saved, always saved. Our Calvinistic friends deny that a saved person can do anything that will jeopardize his salvation or cause him to lose his soul. Now, they recognize that it's possible for a fellow who's a Christian to sin. And they recognize that sin displeases God no matter who does it, whether it's a Christian or not Christian. <laughs> Well, you say, if, if they sin and they displease God, then how can they stay saved? And, of course, his answer is, they're saved, and they can't lose their salvation. Ah, but they can lose their rewards. When they get to heaven, they, they can't lose that salvation. They can't miss heaven, but they can lose the rewards that otherwise would have been theirs when they got to heaven. Now that concept, that kind of a concept of varying degrees of reward is, is as far from the Bible and what the Bible teaches is just about anything I can think of. And the real undermining thing that undermines that whole concept is the Bible just absolutely and simply does not teach once saved, always saved. That's a false concept. It's a comforting idea. And it allows a fellow to do a few things and consider himself a Christian and then go on about life as if he weren't a Christian and enjoy all of the uh, all of the enticements of the devil and still hope to make it to heaven when life is over. It's very comforting, but it just isn't true. James writes in James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, he said, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, 
Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Here is an individual who has adhered to the truth and then he wanders from the truth. Now, I shouldn't have to tell anybody this, but just in case, I'll tell you, you can't wander from some place you've never been. If you've never been in the truth, you can't wander from the truth. He says, if anyone who is among you wanders from the truth and one turns him back, you can't turn back to some place you've never been. I preached this sermon last Sunday morning in, in the port, and I told the folks there's not a way in the world I can go back to Chicago. I cannot go. I, I, it's physically impossible for me to go back to Chicago. You know why? Because I've never been to Chicago. Now, I could go to Chicago, but I can't go back to Chicago. Because before I can go back, I'll have to first be there, won't I? I'll have to be there and leave. Then I can go back. But right now, right now, all of the power in the universe couldn't take me back to Chicago. Because if I went to Chicago, I wouldn't be going back. I've never been there. Now, this passage is talking about someone who's been in the truth. He wandered from the truth. Someone turns him back to the truth. And the fellow who turns him back to the truth has saved a soul from death. Now that passage shows that a person who has adhered to the truth and then wandered from it is lost. And unless he's turned back to the truth, his soul will be doomed eternally. Let's look at one more passage. This is found in 2 Peter chapter 2. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, The Bible says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, A dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Here are individuals who have come to know and embrace the way of truth. But after a while embracing the way of truth, they turn again to the pollutions of the world and once again become entangled in those things. And the Bible says the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. They are worse off now than they were before they ever became Christians. <coughs> Now, if that says something about varying rewards in heaven, it tells us there's a little corner of heaven that's even worse than hell. Here are some folks that are, that are in worse condition. They're, they're, they're worse off than if they had never become Christians. Now, I'll tell you what, I don't know much about a heaven that's got a corner of hell in it. Uh, that, that kind of heaven might not mean much to a fellow. Uh, don't worry about that. That's for some other time. <laughs> and, and, and so the Bible does, does not say that it's impossible for a Christian to stray away or that it's impossible for a Christian to, to endanger his soul. The Bible, in fact, says that when a person becomes a Christian, lives apart from this world's entanglements, and then somehow gets back involved in those things again, he's worse off than he was before he became a Christian. And it would have been better had he never known the right way than to have known it and left it. So the concept of once saved, always saved is not a Bible concept. And if somebody talks to you about bearing rewards in heaven, they say, oh, well, you can't lose your soul and you can't lose your home. You can lose your rewards, but you're going to go to heaven. I'll tell you what, the heaven... The heaven that's worse than the hell that the fellow who never became a Christian had. I don't want that kind of heaven. And I don't think you do. I don't want one where I lose the reward to the extent that I'm worse off than a non-Christian is. Do you? Now, 
let's look at a third idea. Having dismissed the concept of salvation by faith only, having dismissed the concept of once saved, always saved, let's get on with the subject. One thing that I want to point out at this point in the lesson, and the main thing right at this point is that rewards of a Christian, the rewards of Christianity begin in this life. In the 10th chapter of the book of Mark, verses 30 and 31, I find my personal favorite passage of Scripture. Just about everybody, I guess, who studies the Bible have one or two favorite passages, and this just happens to be mine. It says, verse 20, 29 and 30 is what I have in mind here. Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. You say, when I became a Christian, my family disinherited me. That's sad, and that's bad, and we wish that were not so. But you have more brothers and sisters now than you had before you became a Christian. Hopefully nobody here has had to leave father or mother or children or lands or whatever. But if you do, you can't outgive God. If you have to give up those things in order to have a right relationship with God, you can't outgive God. If you have to give up a sister or a brother, if you have to give up a family in order to be faithful to the Lord, then you be faithful to the Lord. And you've got a bigger family than you ever had before. You've got all the Lord's faithful children as your brothers and sisters in Christ. The older ones treating you as if you were a son or a daughter. The younger ones treating you as if you were a parent to them. And this kind of relationship is the kind of relationship God intends for Christians to have with each other. Uh, I haven't traveled very extensively in my lifetime. There are a lot of places I haven't been. Uh, I had never been to this part of this country until uh, last January, this past, uh, or, or March rather, this past March. Uh, but uh, uh, I have brothers and sisters in Christ here and in other lands. And wherever I go, and though I do not try to take unfair advantage of them, and I, I know they wouldn't want to take unfair advantage of me, I'll tell you one thing. If I get off somewhere where I don't know anybody, and I get in trouble, I feel like I have somebody I can turn to. I have brothers and sisters in Christ who love me. They don't even know me, but they love me. They care for me. And they'll help me if they can. And they'll encourage me as best they can. Well, they're not perfect. And if I knew all there was to know about them, I'd be disappointed in them, and they'd be disappointed in me. But, you know, we have in our families, brothers and sisters, we get disappointed with each other once in a while, don't we? Parents and children get disappointed with each other once in a while, don't they? But when the final analysis comes in, most of the time, we do just about anything for each other if we can, won't we? And in this world, as we pass through this world, there are a lot of blessings that come to a fellow from being a Christian. Now, there's some things to give up, but you can't outgive God. And the things you give up in order to be faithful to the Lord, you didn't need them. They were in the way. It'd been all right if they hadn't been in the way. But if you have to give them up to be faithful to the Lord, go ahead and give them up. You can't outgive out the Lord. You're going to come out on top. What you have, you begin to experience the rewards of Christianity, forgiveness of sins. That's worth something. The world doesn't realize what that's worth. This fellow that goes to the, uh, to the I don't know what you call them around here. <laughs> Where I come from, uh, juke joints, honky tonks, beer joints when I was a kid, that's what we called them. Whatever you call them, I don't know what you call them around here, but whatever, the, the fellows who go there, and they go there every Friday night, and they get off work, and they're there every Saturday night, and, and, and they're still uh, uh, trying to get over it Sunday afternoon. 
so they can get back up some, uh, Monday morning and go to work again. Uh, they don't realize what they're missing. They, they, think, they think Christians have a hard life. They just don't realize what they're missing. They don't realize the blessing of, of knowing that even though you've done wrong, your sins have been forgiven. They don't realize what it is to have fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, they're out here in a world where it's dog eat dog, and they think everybody thinks that way. And they can't turn their back on anybody. And we know that though there aren't as many people as we'd like to be able to say this about, we know there are people you can trust. And you can depend on who love you and care about you and will do what they can to help you. And we have hope. There are people in this world that fear and they dread death and they, they, they won't even let the subject come up. But a Christian who has been forgiven of his sins and who knows what the Bible teaches about heaven and knows what the Bible teaches about God and his love for us. Oh, I'm not saying they're in a hurry to pass on, but I'll say this, they can face, face death with a certain degree of tranquility because they have hope and they believe that being a Christian is going to make a lot of difference. Now, those are some rewards we have now. We don't have to wait for the final judgment to have forgiveness and fellowship with God and his people and hope. We have that now. And uh, the sooner you become a Christian, the sooner you have those blessings. And the longer you live as a faithful child of God, the longer you enjoy those blessings. Yes, we have blessings by being Christians. And we don't have to wait till this life is over to begin to experience the rewards of Christianity. Now, he says, and in the age to come, eternal life. Now, let's think a moment about this idea of different rewards in heaven. If there are varying rewards in heaven, we may be sure of some things on which those differences will not be based. First of all, if there are varying rewards in heaven, it will not be because of how many sins you commit. The number of sins will not be involved in. I say that because Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, along with a lot of other passages, show us that when, when, when God forgives a sin, he remembers it against us no more. I may have committed 10,000 sins, but if I've been forgiven for them, they'll not be brought up against me again. I'm not going to lose some reward because of a sin that God has totally erased and wiped out and forgotten about. On the other hand, Revelation 21, verse 27, says of that eternal city, but there shall be by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. How many sins keep me out of heaven? One unforgiven sin. 10,000 sins God has forgiven will not keep me out, but one that he has not forgiven will keep me from going to heaven. I must meet God's condition so I can be forgiven of my sins. And if I've been forgiven of my sins, the number of sins I committed, that won't enter the picture at all. But if I face God in the day of judgment with unforgiven sin in my life, the number of unforgiven sin is not going to make any difference. The sin God will not forgive is going to keep me out of heaven. Now, God is willing to forgive all my sins. Don't get me wrong. He is, he is eager to forgive all my sins. But forgiveness is conditional. I must believe in Jesus Christ and repent of my sins. If I'm not a Christian, I need to confess my faith in Jesus, be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin. God will forgive me if I meet his conditions. And as a child of God, I go out and I still make mistakes. Sure I do. But God wants to forgive me. 
some people have the concept that God's sort of an old man just sitting on the edge of his chair just, just looking down hoping he can see somebody do something wrong so he can pounce upon them. And that's just as wrong. That concept of God is just as false as it can be. If God is sitting there on the edge of his seat watching us, it's looking, hoping to see somebody repent. The Bible says that when one sinner repents, there's, there's rejoicing in heaven. God doesn't want to see us lost. He wants to see us saved. That's why he sent his son to die for us. So God wants to forgive all my sins. If I let him, he will. But I've got to meet his conditions. That's the way I allow him to do that. Two wills are involved in my being right with God. God's will and mine. And I've got to submit mine to him. And if I'll do that, if I'll willingly submit to his will, then I'll be forgiven of my sins. One sin will keep you out of heaven if you aren't forgiven for it. And no amount of sins will keep you out if you are forgiven. Okay, if there are different degrees of reward or varying rewards in heaven, it will not be because of which sins you committed. Somebody said, well, now, I didn't do any big sins. I just did little ones. I never did murder anybody. I didn't do anything like that, any of those important sins. I just did the little bitty sins that don't amount to anything. Well, there aren't any. <laughs> that kind of sin doesn't exist. Here's what James says in James chapter 2. James chapter 2, I want us to look at verses 10 and 11. Verse 10 is a difficult passage because too many people don't read verse 11. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Now, a lot of people stop there and they say, well, now, you just don't have any hope at all. If you do one puny little thing, God's going to throw the book at you. He's going to hold you accountable for every sin imaginable. No, that, that misses the point. Verse 11 goes on and, and does some explaining. So let's read verse 10 and go on into verse 11. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now, this is part of what we were talking about last night. You don't have to commit every sin to be guilty of sin. The same one, the reason the sin of adultery and the sin of murder are equally important is because the same one who said do not commit murder said do not commit adultery. The reason it's wrong is because of who said it. If you don't respect who said it, you're a sinner. It may be some other sin not mentioned there, but if you don't respect the God who said don't do it, then that attitude would allow you to do anything and everything that's wrong that ever has been imagined by the mind of men. No restraints because you don't respect he who said do not commit murder. Uh, one preacher friend of mine illustrates it like this. He, he says that a, a man... Uh, was going to be away for a while, and he left his son in charge of the farm. And he told his son, uh, and he just bought this farm, he put his son in charge of it, and he said, now son, I want you to build a house over here, and over here I want you to build a barn, uh, and uh, down here I want you to uh, dig the well. And so the son, uh, the father leaves, he leaves the son in charge, the son said, all right, I'm supposed to build a house here, and put the barn over here, and the well over here. He gets to thinking, you know, it looks to me like the well ought to be a little closer to the house. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put the well, I'm going to, not going to, do, I'm going to put the well right here. So his father comes back in a few years and he sees everything. He says, son, you didn't obey me. Oh, yes, dad. I, oh, no, you didn't obey me. He said, well, dad, I put the house right where you told me to and I put the barn right where you told me. The only thing I moved at all was the well that moved it a little ways. Son, you didn't obey me. Son, you didn't respect what I said. You didn't do anything I wanted you to. Well, wait a minute. I put the house in the right place. I put the barn in the right place. Yeah, but you just did it because you wanted to. You didn't do it out of respect for me. You put it there because that's where you wanted it. How do I know? You put the well where you wanted it. And so I know the reason you put the house there because that's where you wanted the house. You didn't put it there because I told you to. You put it there because you wanted it there. And you put the barn over here not because I told you to. You put the barn there because that's where you wanted it. Now how do I know that? 
because of what you did about the well. You did what you wanted to. Now, there are people who think they've obeyed the Lord. who have just gone through life doing what they wanted to. They've done some things the Lord said, but it's almost a coincidence. They're doing what they want to do. When King Saul went down, we talked about that last night, King Saul went down to fight with the Amalekites. He did what he wanted to, didn't he? He brought back some of the sheep and some of the cattle, and he brought back the king alive. Otherwise, otherwise he did everything God said. But the reason he did is because he wanted to. And when God told him something he didn't want to do, he didn't pay attention to him, did he? Now, when, that's what James is getting at when he says, if you're guilty of one sin, you're guilty of all. It's the attitude. You don't respect God who said don't do that. And if you don't respect what God said, you'll do anything you want to. There are a lot of people who seem righteous outwardly, and the main reason is because they just happen to not have much ambition when it comes to sin. They just commit a few sins because that's the only ones they want to commit. But if they want to do the other, they do them too. Now, if there are varying rewards in heaven, it won't be because of which sins you committed. Because in reality, the attitude that will allow you to commit one sin will allow you to commit any. Either you respect God enough to obey him, or you don't. Put the pressure on a fellow, if that's what it takes, and he'll commit other sins. Now, all of them are going to have to be repented of, and they're going to have to be forgiven. And if they are, it won't matter which ones you committed. If they aren't, it still won't matter which ones you committed. Because a sin is a sin is a sin. Okay, if there are varying rewards... It won't be because of how long a person served the Lord. Uh, in, in Matthew, the 20th chapter, Jesus speaks a parable about the workers in the vineyard. And the primary purpose of that parable uh, was to show that the Gentiles who come into the faith later on after the Jews will not be slighted when the, when the reward is handed out. They'll get the same privileges and same benefits as the Jews who become Christians. Uh, but there seems to be, at least to some degree, uh, a bearing on our subject because all of those who worked in the vineyard received the same pay. Now, I'm not going to make a big case out of that because, again, the basic purpose of the parable is to show that the Jews have no advantage over the Gentiles. But now I want to suggest another thing. If there are varying rewards in heaven, it will not be on how faithful a servant has been. Now, you may not agree with this, so listen to me a minute. It will not, if they're very much, it won't be on how faithful you've been. Every one of us probably use different adjectives to describe faithfulness. Every once in a while, somebody will ask me about some, somebody they know who lives in the town I live in. They say, is uh, so-and-so still faithful in the church? And often as not, I say, well, they're, uh, they're pretty faithful. They're, they're not as faithful as they used to be, but they're pretty faithful. Or I may say, well, they're, they're more faithful than they were when I first came there. But all that is just a bunch of mumbo-jumbo <coughs> to keep from saying what I really ought to be saying. No, they're not faithful. They're not faithful. You see, pretty faithful is not a Bible term. And more faithful is not a Bible term. And less faithful is not a Bible term. The Bible talks about faithful and not faithful. And when you get right down to it, we fit in one or the other of those. Either we're faithful or we're not faithful. Now, when it comes to rewards and when it comes to judgment, the Bible says that the fellow of whom God can say, well done, good and faithful servant, he'll receive the reward. Well done, good and faithful servant, but I guarantee you the Lord's not going to say that to this pretty faithful fellow. He's not going to say, well done, reasonably faithful servant. <laughs> that just isn't in there. To the unfaithful, we read in Matthew 25, verse 30, to the unprofitable servant, he'll be cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So a fellow's either faithful 
and he gets whatever God has for the faithful servant, or he's unfaithful, and he gets what God has reserved for the unfaithful servant. And there isn't anything between that. We, we put all the in-between stuff there. The Lord didn't put that. Now, I say all of us, and there may be some exceptions here, but basically we all use that kind of terminology, don't we? But if we want to be brutally frank about it, either a fellow's faithful or he's not faithful. And by the way, faithful doesn't mean how much he attends services necessarily. That, that may be one gauge that you, that you can kind of get some ideas by. Fortunately, of course, we don't have to really do the judging on that for the most part. But we, there, there are some faithful Christians who don't attend the services. They're bed fast. They're in nursing homes. They're in hospitals. They're not attending services, but they're faithful to the Lord. They're doing to the very best of their ability everything God wants them to do. There are some other people who come to nearly all the services. They aren't faithful. They go out and live like the devil for a week and then come to church on Sunday. They're not faithful. There's more to it than how much you attend service. Now, that's involved. But there's more than that, too. Okay. Now, let's look at a couple of passages that may suggest varying rewards. And because of the time element, we won't, we won't look at this first one uh, real close. But let's look briefly at Luke 19. Uh, the, the parable is, is in Luke chapter 19. Uh, and uh, verses 11 through 27 in particular uh, has perhaps some bearing on this subject. Uh, the Lord gave, uh, tells a parable in which uh, a man gave his servants uh, a piece of money. He gave to different servants one piece of money. When he came back, one of those had taken the one piece of money and produced ten. Another servant had taken the one and produced five. Another had taken the one, wrapped it up in a napkin, and hid it so it'd be there when the Lord returned. Now to the first two, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. These men were faithful. One had produced ten, one had produced five, but they were faithful. They were equally faithful. The difference was in their ability. The difference was not in their faithfulness. The difference was in their ability. Now, uh, the primary lessons of this parable is not anything to do with rewards in heaven. The primary lessons are twofold, uh, having to do with the establishment of the kingdom of God not being immediate. They were near Jerusalem, verse, uh, verses 11 and 12 tell us. They were near Jerusalem, and some of the people in the crowd thought that when Jesus got to Jerusalem, he would proclaim himself a king and set up his kingdom. And so Jesus spoke this parable, first of all, to make them realize that he had to go away to a far country. There he would receive his kingdom, in heaven, actually. In this far country, he'd receive his kingdom, and having received it, he'd later come back and judge his servants. The second thing that was involved in it was the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, there were some who, when the king sent his son, when different ones came, different messengers, they slew them and, and mistreated them and they would get their just desserts down the line. And so those are the two basic ideas. But the idea of, of uh, rewards, varying rewards may be suggested. The man who took the one uh, piece of money and produced ten was put over ten cities. The man who took the one piece of money and produced five was put over five cities. Why? Why the different? Different abilities. Now, does that mean there'll be varying rewards in heaven? If it does. I'm not saying that it does. If it does, it will be on the basis of our ability to absorb those rewards. And it will be in, on the basis of our ability. Not on the basis of how faithful we were, on the basis of our ability to use it. It could just as well say, if it suggests anything about heaven at all, it may not even be suggesting things about heaven. But if it is, the idea could be of different duties and responsibilities in the, in the eternal realm. There, his servants will serve him. And again, if there are differing abilities, that may very well involve that. We need to understand that parables, parables were stories used basically to illustrate one or two points, and a lot of the details of the story are just there to make the story come alive. I remember studying Revelation uh, with a, an, an elderly preacher one time, 
And I was just uh, just beginning to do uh, quite a bit of preaching, and I, I asked him, what, uh, what do you think about so-and-so in the book of Revelation? He had a painting on the wall, and he walked up to the painting on the wall, and he put his finger on a little dark area in the painting, a little dark spot, and he said, what do you think this dark spot means? Well, I walked over and looked at it, and I stepped back and looked at it, and I went over here and looked at it. Finally, I had almost a shame. I had said, I don't know what does it mean. He said, doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's just part of the picture. You can so divide prophetic statements and parables sometimes that you miss the point by trying to make a point out of something that may just be a part of the overall story. Had a fellow ask me one time in the story of the rich man Lazarus, said, what do you think the dogs were? You know, the dog came and licked you, what do you think the dogs were? I always thought they were dogs. I never thought they meant anything. They were just dogs. They were just part of the story. Uh, the parables are sometimes that way. The parable may be expressing one basic point. And if you take it apart limb from limb and try to make... And, and, the, and the, the, the pictures in Revelation, the, the prophecies in Revelation, if you take every hair and every toenail on every beast, you're going to miss the basic point that underlies the, the picture. Okay, now, I realize you don't want to stay all day, so let's look at one more passage, uh, and we won't take much time on it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Paul says, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so is by fire, or through fire. This is the passage that Calvinist likes to use with his once saved, always saved. He says, here's a fellow, and he goes out here, and he's working, and he's working, and he's working, and some of his works are not what they ought to be, and so when his works are tested, some of them are burned, but he stays saved. That's the Calvinistic explanation. That's not what Paul is talking about. In the context, go back to verse 9. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. We, he's talking about a Paul, a Paul and Apollos and other inspired preachers. He said, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Okay, the church as a whole was God's building. Paul and Apollos and other inspired men were the workers. They were the ones building the building. The foundation is Jesus Christ, verse 11. And so uh, uh, we inspired preachers will be preaching uh, and working on this foundation, Paul says. Now, some of what we put on this foundation won't stay. Paul converted some people who fell away. Apollos converted some people and they came in the church for a while, but they didn't stay faithful. Now, Paul says some of our, our work is going to be tested. God's building, this building that we're putting together made up of people that are going to be tested. And part of the building materials are going to have to be thrown out. But he says we will be saved because we did what God told us to. Now, that's in the days of inspired preachers. There's a principle involved even today. As we build, lay the foundation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we build upon that foundation, we go out with the gospel and we proclaim the gospel and we teach people and we baptize people into Christ. And someday, every one of us are going to be tested. And some are going to be cast away. But the individual who's faithfully stood for the truth of God and proclaimed the word of God doesn't fear his salvation. He's going to be saved, even though some of the people he got into the church may go back out. It's not his fault. Now, if... There are varying rewards in heaven, and I, I, this, this is one that I can kind of see and understand a little bit. If there is anything that make heaven any better, and I don't know if there is, but if there's anything that make heaven any better, it'd be able to look across there somewhere and see somebody that's there because you helped them get there. As a gospel preacher, I can identify with that. And I know many of you can identify with that. There are people we hope to see in heaven and if they make it, it won't be entirely because of us, but we might have helped a little bit. If anything can make heaven any better, I guess that'd be it. Do I believe in varying rewards in heaven? Well, no, not in the Calvinistic sense, not in the evangelical sense. Uh, in 2 John, verse 8, 
John makes a statement. The King James words it this way. Now, some of the translations have it a little different, but this New King James says it this way. Look to yourselves that we, the inspired preachers who taught them, look to yourselves that we not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. John hoped to see the people he taught stay faithful. If they fell away, he would feel a loss. But his salvation was not in jeopardy. Now that's the kind of thing Paul talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, he's not saying that you can just sin as a Christian, you just sin, do whatever you want to, and, and, and your works will be burned and you can go on to hell. And he's not saying that at all. He's not condoning any kind of sin. But he is saying if you go out and teach the gospel and you just work your heart out getting people to listen to and perhaps obey the gospel of Christ and somewhere along life's pathway they lose interest and they go back into the world, you don't have to fear your salvation being in jeopardy. You're going to lose part of what you worked for because you worked to see them go to heaven too. You will suffer loss. You'll regret it. But you'll be saved. How do you be saved? You do what you're supposed to do. You serve the Lord faithfully. And when life's over, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. But I guarantee you he won't say that if you haven't been faithful. Don't think you can be unfaithful and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've got too much, too much imagination if you think that. Okay. Lesson is yours. Consider the things that have been said this morning. Hope you'll come back this evening and the subject will be whether or not uh, God's revelation to man is continuing or if it's all complete in God's Word. If you're subject to invitation this morning, we can help you in any way to be right with the Lord. We want to do that. If you'll come while together we stand and sing.
Father, help us that we keep this lesson in mind throughout the week. And help us, Father, to realize that initially it may be hard to follow your word, but in the long run, you'll be a better person for following your ways. And Father, help us to realize that things that were taught today were 